presenter. <laughs> Thanks, <Faye. laughs> Um, so Megan is a zoologist and wildlife presenter, best known for her work on the BBC Watches series, but also for presenting programmes on the illegal bear bowl trade, uh, an, Earth, an Earth Rise series for Al Jazeera and the CBBC Planet Defenders, to name a few. She is also a passionate photographer, campaigner and has co-written the book Back to Nature, which was published in 2020. So without further ado, Megan, over to you. Hi everyone, thank you very much Alice and Jasmine for that really nice introduction um, and it's so nice to see so many of your faces here tonight so thank you so much for spending your, I think it's Wednesday isn't it, Wednesday evening um, with me having a bit of chat about wildlife and nature and things that you do to further your careers in conservation and how you can get more widely involved. It's a lot of faces and a lot of names that I recognise off social media um, so you're a lot of you know, young wildlife warriors already here. So it's brilliant to see you all. And um, I hope you all had a fantastic Christmas and New Year's. And um, I, like many of you, I'm sure I've been feeling the need to get back to work. I like taking a bit of time off. In fact, I think it's really important that we reground ourselves and we connect with what we love by going outdoors and spending time with nature, in nature. But then sometimes after a little while, I'm like, okay, now I need to use my voice and start campaigning again. So over the last few days, I've been getting stuck back into it as I'm sure many of you have with your studies and campaigning and perhaps various volunteering as well. Um, so I thought I'd talk to you tonight for about 15 to 20 minutes, just a little bit about how I got into conservation um, and to give you guys some tips as well about how you can best do it and depending on what avenue you want to go down and there are a lot of avenues. So I'm going to speak a little bit about my route into it and a little bit about the differences between us and how there actually are strengths when it comes to conservation um, and some funny anecdotes. I hope about some animals that I came to love quite dearly as I was growing up and still do. Um, so I'm going to try and share my screen. I hope it works all right. Uh, I did have some problems with this earlier on, um, but I really wanted to first of all introduce you to a couple of tigers. So let me just, that can everyone see that all right? I can see Alice and Jasmine. Thumbs up. Perfect. Thank you. Um, so I can't ever really talk about myself or particularly my early career without introducing um, a couple of tigers to you, because these are the animals which ultimately changed the course of my career and really drove me to go into conservation. So here on the left hand side, we have Zia. And on the right hand side, the white tiger there is Zena. And you notice Zena has one eye. She's a one eyed white tiger. Um, and that's unfortunately because she developed glaucoma in her teenage years and had to have her eye removed. Um, but both cats were home and were raised at the Isle of Wight. Well, what was the Isle of Wight Zoo and is now the Wild Heart Trust on the Isle of Wight. They were born in circuses and they were given to the zoo to be reared and would eventually then, when they were old enough, go back to the circus to perform. Um, but luckily for these two, amongst others as well, they were rescued and they got to live out the rest of their years in a zoo which they were loved immeasurably I have to say and you know in the summer they got rum and raisin ice cream they got sun cream put on their nose and um, they were loved so so very much obviously it's not an ideal situation to have animals in captivity but the state of the world at the moment really needs it and these two had the best love they possibly could have had so I met Zia and Zena when I was 12 years old. The first time I ever went to the sanctuary and it was a day which was really special because it was the opening of their enclosure. And Zia on the left hand side had a bit of a personality to be a bit of a princess. She liked to kind of swan around like she owned the place, but she did. She did own the place really. And she sat on top of that rock that you can see her sitting on there. And she looked over the whole place, watching over, making sure that her dinner was on time and everything was just right, which it always was, of course. But my first memories of Zia um, was in the cave where there's this big glass window and I turned my back and I was only 12, so I was quite small. And big cats tend to like small things because they're quite interested because small things tend to move fast. And at 12, I was running around everywhere, excited by the cats. So I obviously caught their attention. I was also wearing a bright pink tracksuit, which might have caused a bit of interest as well because they tend to like bright colours, or Zia did certainly anyway. And I turned my back against a window and the next thing I knew Zia was up against the glass um, looking at me and it caused me quite the fright 
but it sparked a lifelong relationship that I had with her. Um, I went back to the sanctuary every weekend, every time I could after school and developed a really strong relationship with these two animals um, to the point that we got to know each other really, really well. And then there was, if I can move the slide, then there are these two. Now, this is Aisha and Diamond, brother and sister. Um, Diamond's the one behind. He's the male. And you can see there that he's not your average tiger. He hasn't got any black stripes. So he's got a genetic condition where he can't produce any black pigmentation. He's still got the stripes, but he's a strawberry blonde tiger or a tabby tiger. So he's quite rare. And people would always say it looked like he was sticking his tongue out. If you look, his bottom lip there, because he can't produce that black pigment right in the center, it does look like he's sticking his tongue out to people but he was the biggest teddy bear possible um and i got to know these two very very closely as well now before i met these tigers i really struggled with science at school um i don't know how any of you feel about it but i'm, I'm terrible at maths i hold my hands up if any of you ask me any mathematic questions later on um i, I promise that you'll have me sweating i really will struggle with it because i'm really quite bad at numbers and i was at school quite bad with science and i didn't really understand why it took me a little while to figure out how I learned best. And it wasn't until quite later on that I found out that I was quite severely dyslexic. So I learned differently from other people. Um, everybody learns differently from one another. But for me personally, I struggled numerically. My reading was quite behind. Um, and I just, I didn't quite fit in with everybody else and how they were learning at that pace at that particular time. So I really struggled when it came to science when I was at school so much so that I actually didn't think I could be a scientist I didn't think I'd be able to study it and um, so when I came to choosing my GCSEs I chose all the wrong ones I went down drama and performing arts which I now know actually probably helped me in my career in terms of where I'm at now but I would have loved to have done biology and chemistry and everything else I just never had the confidence in myself that I could actually achieve it and then that's when I met these tigers and they are what made me change my mind because I knew if I didn't dedicate myself to try and save their wild counterparts in the wild if I didn't try to make their lives better then that would always be something that I'd regret I knew wildlife was going to be part of what I did but I didn't know to what extent until I met these four tigers which totally changed everything by that point I'd already chosen the wrong GCSEs which meant I had to choose the wrong A-levels so the only science A-level I could choose was environmental science which was really good um, and then it made me have to go on to do a biological science foundation year um, and then on to zoology at the University of Liverpool so I kind of went about it around and about way but what I'm trying to say is that we all learn differently and you've got to be patient with yourself about how you learn um, you might not learn in the same way as the person sitting next to you. And it's these neuro differences and how we learn differently and how we see things differently that I think makes the conservation movement a lot stronger. So how you think, how you feel, how you see things is really unique. It's a unique perspective and should be something that's cherished and should be something that's you know continued on and you should be encouraged to pursue what you're really interested in so don't be discouraged if you're not very good at maths if you're not very good at chemistry or physics or the typical science things at school that you're taught because science is a lot more than what it is in your exam books of course your exams are important and then as is everything else what about english and English, yeah, English is incredibly important as well. I struggled with my reading. I struggled with writing. I was a little bit behind, but I worked really hard at it and I ended up getting um, an A-level in English towards the end. So even if you struggle, just know that there are ways to learn it differently and give yourself patience and, and the chance to do that. Um, anyway, so I always say that it's really important, your studies and getting the qualifications you need, but of equal importance, um, especially when you're looking at going into conservation, is practical experience. It's really important that you start off early, as early as you possibly can, by getting out there, you know, getting your nose in the undergrowth, I'm sure many of you do, um, and, you know, getting your head in the hedges and seeing what's there and getting as much hands-on experience with various different charities that you can. So when I was younger, I started working within the UK. I started doing um, 
work for a wildlife hospital I worked at Brent Lodge Wildlife Hospital I started doing toad patrolling which is great I still do it to this day toad patrolling is great fun you get to walk around all night picking up toads putting them in buckets saving them from from the road when they're moving from their hibernation grounds to their breeding grounds and 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 kind of analyzing them and, and then contributing to citizen science which is something that's really cool and really good fun and if you've never had a bucket full of toads it's something I urge you to do obviously safely and done in the right way but it's really good fun um, but I wanted to kind of explore and try out new areas, places I'd never been to, um, and new species. And I'd always been interested in predatory animals. It didn't matter if they were an insect, a mammal, a fish, it doesn't really matter. I just really am interested in how predators behave and how they try and get their prey. You know, what behaviours and what adaptations do they have in order to live in the environment and survive in the ways that they do? But I was also incredibly interested in the illegal wildlife trade, um, which was something that Alice mentioned in my introduction. Um, I knew about bear bile farming since I was really young. Um, and I also heard about an incredible charity called Animals Asia. So Animals Asia uh, is a charity in China and Vietnam, and they rescue bears that are in bear bile farming industries, but bear bile farming um, markets, and sometimes even in people's homes. Um, and these bears are kept there because they have something called a gallbladder, which is behind their stomach, um, which is full of bile. And that bile is extracted and used in traditional medicines. And they don't live a very nice life at all. They live in quite dire conditions. But this incredible charity does a lot of amazing work in rescuing them and changing the law to make sure that it doesn't have to happen to any more bears in the future. So I really wanted to kind of get involved with that because it combined two of my favorite things, a big predator and helping to combat the illegal wildlife trade. So I went out and lived in China for about three months, um, which was a brilliant experience. I was a behavioral specialist volunteer and it was my job to figure out exactly what was going on with the bears. So I had one enclosure that I was kind of assigned to and inside that it had 12 bears. Now you might think that's a lot of bears for one enclosure, but this enclosure is the biggest enclosure I've ever seen. It was really large and the bears are given so much great enrichment that their lives are incredibly full. Um, but there was a problem with two bears, one of whom is photographed here on the right hand side. This is Handsome Prince. Um, now he was rescued as a cub, so he never went into a bio farm, luckily. So he never knew that kind of torture, but he um, was really lucky to be rescued and unfortunately could never be released back into the wild. So he lived as good a life as he possibly could in, in this sanctuary. And like any young handsome male, he had a big problem. Um, this was his problem, Bonnie. Bonnie was his girlfriend who wouldn't leave him alone. And she got incredibly possessive of him. Wherever Prince went, Bonnie was right next to him. And any other bear that tried to come and say hi to either Bonnie or Prince got a good old telling off. And this was quite unusual behavior for them. So my job was to kind of figure out why this behavior had started and what was going on. So I got to basically watch bears all day, which was really good, but it meant that I got to learn about behavior. It meant I got to learn about interactions and I got to learn about that environment, which was something that was really great. So I was always kind of looking for the next big volunteer experience. What more could I learn? What more can I get from practical um, knowledge? And what can I extract from everything else? Um, so here I am. This is where I sat every single day looking down on the bears there. And you can see that's about a quarter of their enclosure. Um, you can see all the enrichment items and everything that they had, which was fantastic. Um, so after I got back from that, I was approached by a friend of mine at the BBC who was doing a series called Undercover Forest. And they said that one of their stories had fallen through all of a sudden and did I have any ideas? Now at this point in time, I didn't know that I wanted to be a wildlife presenter. I didn't know, I thought I might wanna go into research. I might wanna do a PhD. Um, but I, yeah, it never really was a sole ambition to go into presenting. Science communication was always something that I thought was really interesting, but it had never been something that I would really kind of gone strongly for. Um, and, and then I got this opportunity to go and tell the bear bile farming story in Vietnam with this series Undercover Taurus. And it was so incredibly rewarding to be able to go and tell a story which very few people had heard of go undercover go secretly into these locations to film these bears and try and raise awareness and that was something that I thought was really kind of impactful is getting people empowered getting people aware getting people um 
to see these animals in these situations and hopefully get some change to happen um, and it was great to support Animals Asia in that sense so that was my first kind of go I suppose at presenting and that was back in 2018 no, 2017 I believe so a little while ago now um, and I just really really loved getting to communicate these stories with people um, so that's kind of where I started but I still wanted to kind of go and get as many practical experiences as possible so I also then started volunteering this is in between my university courses in in the summers um because I wanted to make the most of every single possible minute that I had to get as much experience as I could as well as all my exam papers and things like that um so I went to work at a shark research station I thought I'd worked a lot with tigers I'd worked a lot with bears there's one predator that I haven't worked with and there's one ecosystem I haven't worked with very much and that was the marine ecosystem um, and this photograph here was taken on my first night out I'd never seen a shark before so this is a female tiger shark that's been caught on a shark friendly hook um, a hook that was then removed from her but we caught her in order to take measurements so she was measured from her nose down to the tip of her back tail her caudal tail and then the dorsal fin which I'm holding on to is her, her top fin and so lots of measurements there. And then you also take DNA and isotope samples and it helps you survey a population because this research station was in a really sensitive area um, for sharks. Lots of sharks come there to breed because it's just off the Gulf Stream. Um, so it's these moments that really kind of connect you and make you learn practically about, about what you want to do further in your career. But that being said, whilst it's great to go off and do all these volunteer schemes, um, it's also really important that we connect with what's on our own doorstep at the same time. The bears and the sharks are fantastic, but I have to say I've never had quite such a personal connection, other than the tigers perhaps, with any other species than I did some of these badgers that I connected with in lockdown. And if you watched Spring Watch 2020, um, and I think even Autumn Watch 2020, you will actually probably know this badger. So this was the badgers that lived around the back of our house. And we had a clan that at its peak reached 18 individuals. And 18 individuals is a lot for one badger set. It's really a lot. Uh, they dispersed shortly afterwards and went off to make their own sets. But um, for a period of time, it was um, badger galore. There were badgers everywhere, so much so that they got so confident with myself being there. They got so used to my smell because they've got very sensitive noses. And um, that they wouldn't mind bumping into my camera lens. And I always made sure I stayed at least 10 metres back from them so that they had enough space to do their own thing. But they would often wander off in search of peanut and bump into you and get quite the shock. Um, but it was still really brilliant to see. And you can see this individual here isn't your typical badger. Normally badgers have got black and white stripes and they're much more grey around the body. And this individual here, I'd argue, is slightly more rose gold um, coloured. And that's because it's an aristhetic individual, um, which means, again, like Diamond, that tabby tiger I showed you earlier, it's unable to produce that dark pigmentation. Um, but it's a really beautiful animal. And getting practical experience is really good because it helps you survey, it helps you assess, it really kind of gives you that grounding that a lot of conservation organisations need when you go forth into kind of getting a job. And of course, the puffin. Who doesn't love a puffin? It's always been a dream of mine to go and see them and, and work on some of the Welsh islands like um, Skolcombe and Skoma. Uh, I haven't yet done it, but it's on my list of things to go and do is to go and survey the birds out there, the seabirds. Um, but again, it's another fantastic opportunity. Um, and foxes as well, of course. We have to appreciate what's on our own back garden. There's so much that we can do, um, you know, whether that's setting up your own mini experiments in your garden, perhaps getting a camera trap and surveying the behaviour. It all really goes such a long way in terms of your future. Um, and I'm going to end on this last point, um, activism. So activism is a word that I find a lot of people who are, I don't know, I would say grown ups, but often I'd say like my grandparents' age or perhaps my parents' age. The majority of them, when you say the word activism, kind of go, oh, activist. Oh, I'm not sure about that. What's that about? Well, I would argue as a living being, you are active in your environment. You, Everybody is an activist in some way, shape or form, whether that whatever that means to you. So I feel like it's our generation your generation more so, because many of you are a lot younger than me. It's your generation which is going to reclaim that word 
And that's a really exciting thing because the most powerful thing that you can do right now, the most important thing that you can do is use your voice. Because like this banner says, there is no planet B. Now, I'm sure all of you are aware of Friday's future. I hope many of you have been involved with it, um, obviously carefully during COVID and when regulations allow. But it's a really important thing that we're able to use our voices um, and talk about what really matters. So whether you want to join on the streets and you're happy to kind of campaign, um, whether you join the BTO and do some fantastic citizen science there, it's always great when the BTO's reports come out because there's lots of bird ringing um, opportunities for you within there. Um, whether you put in... Um, a hedgehog box in the back of your garden you build a wildlife pond you hang a bird feeder it is what activism means to you that's important but as long as we are active in some way shape or form then we're doing the world some good so that's pretty much it but I want to leave you with the the notion of you know be empowered don't be afraid to stand up and use your voice you're never too young to start using it you know, you might think that, you know, you'll do it when you get older, but there is never a more important time than now. And people are listening to young people more than they ever have done before. So your voices are incredibly powerful. And remember that no matter how you learn um, and what's important to you, just keep going with it because you'll find the way that suits you best. Thank you, Megan. I think that was a great place to leave that. Um, I'm sure there are very many young people on this call that are feeling very inspired. Um, and if any of you would like to put questions in the chat, we'll read them out for you, or you can unmute yourself and we uh, can listen to your questions. Um, I'll start off with my own question, actually, um, that I've been wondering during your talk, um, and I've been following your career myself for some time, and I was just wondering whether, as a campaigner, do you sometimes feel anxious about speaking up about controversial um, issues as you have done in the past about hen harriers and do you fear potential backlash maybe from um, speaking about those issues? Yeah um, I, I mean I think sometimes the potential backlash is sadly the, the way of the world at the moment which is you know really quite devastating in many ways because we should all be able to speak about those issues especially when it comes to illegal raptor persecution and illegal fox hunting and various different things. Um, I try not to feel anxious about it because for me, it, it isn't about me. You know, if I get any backlash, fine, that's OK, because in my head, I'm comforted in the fact that I'm doing the right thing or I'm trying to do the right thing for the environment or for wildlife. Um, so I think, you know, if if we all felt anxious about it and worried about it, we wouldn't get anywhere and we wouldn't make those changes. We can't let them intimidate us because then they win. So we have to keep going. We have to keep fighting. We have to keep telling those stories, which are sometimes difficult to tell. But as long as we're telling them in a peaceful way, as long as we're being polite about it, as long as we are being strong, but polite, obviously, um, I think it's really important that we continue because ultimately the reason why we're getting a bit of backlash, the reason why there is a bit of pushback is because things are changing things are changing and they're changing fast. It's going to be a big year for fox hunting this year, for example. It'll be a big year for Hen Harrier Day and raptor persecution as well. We're going to be really looking at that and campaigning for that this year. Um, so, you know, for me, that change is more important than anything. So I, I try not to be anxious about what, what would happen um, because ultimately, you know, we're seeing the changes that we want to see, even though they're happening slower than we'd like. We've got to kind of keep pushing and keep fighting for what's right. Absolutely. Yeah, I think they're wise words. Thank you. Um, so our first question in here is from Amy. I don't know whether you wanted to turn your mic on, Amy, and uh, ask. Otherwise, we don't mind re reading that out for you. Uh, hi, thank you. Um, and thanks for a great introduction there, Megan. Um, I just wanted to ask, for me personally, I'm towards like the end of my academic career. I'm in the middle of my master's. And I was just wondering, like, next steps in terms of going from the academic side of conservation into getting a job in a conservation sector would you say potentially starting off as a volunteer and then working up that way is a potential route into it just interested to hear sort of going from an academic side into a more professional setting yeah I mean volunteering is always really helpful because it just gets you to know the people that hopefully might employ you later on I um, mean it starts opening doors just with contacts for various different things and gives you that practical um, experience that I was talking about earlier 
um, I would say as early as you can, congratulations, by the way, on finishing your master's this year. It'd be very exciting. Um, but yeah, I'm, as early as you can, I'd start sending out emails and it doesn't necessarily have to be, you know, I'm looking for a job or anything that can come a little bit later, but just, you know, touch base with people, see exactly what's going on and how you might be able to help. And if you have free weekends, I know masters are quite full on, um, you know, if you do have spare time and exactly how you can kind of get involved with the projects that are already happening. Um, but I'd start doing research definitely on, on what field exactly you want to go in and you know the people that would be good to talk to and connect with them over social media is a good one LinkedIn's always really good but um yeah the more you can kind of converse with them earlier on and and they get to know your name and your face the, the better it will be I think that's lovely thank you no worries okay thank you Megan um I've had another question come in so this one's from Maya and Maya would like to know do you have any tips for young people who would like to get opportunities within presenting? Yeah, absolutely. So one thing that you can do is just turn the camera on yourself. You don't need a big fancy camera. Um, you know, an iPhone will do just fine or any phone for that matter. Um, and just kind of get a tripod or balance it on a tree if you're just starting out and want to give it a go. Um, and just think of a story, perhaps that's even in your garden, you know, what your garden birds up to this spring or anything like that. And just and just give it a go, you know, get used to being in front of the camera, get used to feeling kind of comfortable. You can write yourself a script if you'd like to. Um, and do it that way or you can kind of ad lib it I always recommend just kind of getting in front of the camera and seeing what comes out if you learn lines quite a lot you can find yourself in your own or I do personally everybody's different but I find myself tripping over the lines too much so I like to kind of just see what happens when I start talking and um, and you know if you're passionate about the birds which or whichever story you choose and um, then that kind of really comes across but the most the most important advice I can give with presenting is just you want to have as many little films as possible um, so that you're comfortable in front of the camera and so that you can show people going forward. So if you start maybe a social media um, platform or a YouTube channel or something so that you can start sharing those stories and get your face out there and get known a little bit, which is always really useful. It's a really welcoming community online. Um, and everyone's incredibly supportive. Um, and there's lots of people out there willing to give advice if you message them or anything like that. Um, but the best thing I can do is just, you know, use a phone and just give it a go and see, see how you feel and see how it goes. But it's always a really kind of exciting thing and find your own style. That's another important thing is, you know, see what works for you and add, don't be afraid to add a bit of personality into it. Um, you know, really go for it and use your flair as much as you possibly can. Thank you. Um, so the next one, I think, is in relation to the bears that you had on the screen earlier. So did you ever find out what was wrong with those bears? Yeah, well, they were actually um, they moved enclosure about a couple of weeks before I got there. Um, and the enclosure they moved to was slightly more open than their previous one. Um, so essentially, that I, I think it was that they didn't have quite as many places that they could kind of just rest and be by themselves. Um, a bit of a lone time for a young couple, I think, was what they were after, uh, essentially. But they did, after um, after I left, actually, a couple months in, I always check back and see how they're doing, because I totally love those bears. But they were doing much better, and they'd kind of settled into their new enclosure and were doing a lot better. And Bonnie was much friendlier to the other bears, which is good. <laughs> Well, that's great. Thank you, Megan. Um, I think, does Micah um, have a hand up? I don't know if you wanted to pop your microphone on to ask a question. I'm a bit too young to go for like, um, start and um, go to university yet. So what should I do kind of between now and then? Lots to do. So I would have a look at your local area um, and see what opportunities there are. So I think I was 10 when I started working at a local, my local bird hospital. Um, and I got experience then doing lots of different stuff. I did everything with, from pigeons to foxes to hedgehogs. Um, so I went around and did as much of that as I possibly could, because isn't, you're never too young to start getting that volunteer experience in. Um, and there's lots of places that were really keen to get young people's help. If you look at frog life, I mentioned to going um looking at toad patrolling before that's a really good thing to do and um, you might need a, a parent potentially to go with you because you do walk along the roads at night um but again it's such a great way to kind of get outdoors but have a look locally see what conservation um 
organizations are doing in your area um, and then just start messaging and getting involved and there's lots of different youth groups like this fantastic one here um, that you can kind of ask for for advice or any kind of initiatives or programs to get involved with but um, that's the best thing I can do I say really is just get as much experience as you possibly can dive head first in and in you know your free time after school as much as you possibly can get out and about and just experience it sit and just enjoy it as well you know it's about learning it and it's important to immerse yourself in getting that experience but it's also really important to enjoy it too yeah I totally agree with that you're never too young to get involved in nature conservation uh thank you for that Megan so the next question we have um is a great question from Mary um which animal have you studied um whose behavior is the most interesting Oh, that's a difficult one because I'd say that every animal's behavior is pretty interesting. It's all they're all interesting in their own right. Um, let me have a look. I, I worked with pangolins. I filmed pangolins before, which are pretty special. Do you know, everyone know what a pangolin is? You can see faces, people nodding. Yeah, a lot of people don't, you know, a lot of people in the UK, I think there was a survey done and about 85% of people didn't know what a pangolin was, which is understandable because they're a species which isn't talked about very often and they're not given a lot of limelight, but they are the most trafficked animal in the world. They are um, a mammal that I suppose some people compare to an armadillo, although they're not related to armadillos whatsoever. Um, they are a scaly mammal with a really long tongue um, and they are incredibly difficult to kind of conserve because you can't keep them in captivity because their diet is too specific so they have to eat a certain type of termite or a certain type of ant at particular times of the year and they live throughout Africa and Asia and there's I think seven or eight different subspecies of them um, but they're very particular about what ants they must eat and when or which termites to eat and when um, and they've got the most amazing tongues their tongues come out out of their mouth and they are the longest tongues ever they're fantastic their tongues go all the way down our tongues start at the back of our jaw here but for a pangolin their tongue the bottom of their tongue starts all the way down at their hip joints so they've got the tongue that goes all the way down their body and come all the way out and of course they need that long sticky tongue so that it can get into termite mounds and ant mounds and different things but they're really cool and there's not much that we know about them so a friend of mine Kelsey researches them out in Namibia and she gets to see this amazing footage of them in their burrows and how their young actually grip on their backs like a little rucksack. Um, and they're the most kind of adorable little things, but really interesting because we don't know that much about them. So any kind of discovery is always really exciting. So I'd go pangolin probably is quite interesting, but they're all interesting in their own right. I've just got to say, I absolutely love pangolins. <laughs> so cute, aren't they? They <laughs> off as well, it's so cute. Um, I believe that uh, Rufus might have had their hand up. Again, I don't know if you want to pop your mic on so you can ask your question. Thanks for that great talk, Megan. I've just started looking at GCSEs and I was wondering which ones you'd recommend. I'd like to work in conservation and management when okay. I grow up. Okay, great. Um, so yeah, all the science ones are really good. If you can do your triple sciences, um, that was always really good. Um, maths and statistics, if, if you're that way inclined, I was awful. I, did, I ended up doing double science and double maths. Um, and, you know, at that, at that point in time, that was kind of how I knew that I could learn it. But if you can do triple science and um, maths and statistics, then that definitely does help when you go into kind of your A-levels and going into a conservation background. Um, but yeah, I mean, there's lots of different ways that you can do. I would actually also recommend people doing art and a lot of people will kind of raise an eyebrow at me doing that. But I think when it comes to kind of conservation, the more that we can expand how we talk about science, expand how we talk about animals in creative ways, the better. So if we can kind of learn how to, whether that's graphics design, whether that's art, whether that's drama or music, whatever kind of you're interested in, all of those different skill sets can be used in conservation. Um, and I would argue that, you know, the science is really important, but also doing some kind of creative is really good too, because that will teach you how to better communicate, I suppose, that science um, to kind of why audiences that might not always understand that really new science that you do but will understand you know a creative way of you explaining it so that can never be underestimated as well so I'd always go for you know a couple a couple sciences and maybe a creative one as well but I quite I quite enjoy the creative ones if you're really science-minded then go full-on science go go crazy knock your socks off with statistics but um you know 
it's all each to their own and whatever you excel at do whatever you excel at and all of it can be applied in some way to conservation lovely thank you and the next message in the chat is from becky becky would you like to put your mic on no worries if not yeah okay main, the main oh, sorry, go on, becky. Is, um is a wildlife park like a good place to get into conservation if, like apart from like the ex situ projects because i currently volunteer at the cotswolds wildlife park and have done since like may time but i'm not sure if how i use it if i decide zookeeping isn't really my thing yeah definitely I mean I did a zookeeping for a little while as well and it definitely teaches you again a lot about behavior a lot about animals and again a lot about science communication because if you're zookeeping I'm sure you kind of give talks and you interact with a lot of people that come into um into the zoo or sanctuary all the time so you actually build up a lot of really important skills there I think in terms of just talking to people um so for me yeah I mean I really enjoyed my time doing it I thought it was really good and again that's a way of getting hands-on experience and there are definitely avenues from that a lot of um I don't know if Cotswold Wildlife Park I don't know that wildlife park particularly well but it's always um good to ask I suppose what other projects they've got going on so a lot of these kind of conservation parks will be working within the UK um with various different kind of conservation organizations so for example the wild heart trust where where i've kind of spent my time they do a lot of stuff with um the sea eagle project which is coming to the isle of Wight. they do some stuff with hedgehogs and various different things so you could always ask them what else they're doing outside of their own park and see if you could get involved in kind of the outreach side of things um so because typically they, there is always something going on and um, whether that's within the uk or potentially even further afield that there might be opportunities in so it's just worth asking and kind of getting involved and expanding out and just talking about, you know, where you best see yourself fitting. Um, I suppose, but yeah, I mean, for me, I found it was kind of really beneficial in, in kind of what I do today. So, yeah. Okay, uh, Hattie, would you like to ask your question? Yeah, hi. So um, from a young like campaigner and like you said, activist point of view, who's been doing this for a few years, has done volunteering in different sectors. I've got opportunities that are like being handed to me. But my question is, how can I turn this from doing something that I do as a volunteer basis to doing it as like becoming my job? That's the hard thing. And I think there's a lot of great volunteer opportunities in the conservation sectors and there aren't enough transitions into kind of actually getting full-time positions where you're actually going to earn a living because at the end of the day we all do need to earn money in some way shape or form and that can be hard in conservation when a lot of a lot of the volunteer schemes are you know full on a lot of hours and you know don't don't pay for anything um i think you know you've got to have candid conversations with the people that you're working with about the opportunities that are available and having those as early on as possible is a really good thing so don't be afraid to broach those kind of subjects about it um everyone's you know wanting to support young people or hopefully they should be um so you know giving those kind of opportunities is is really important it's just i suppose a, a timing thing of when they come along but don't be afraid to kind of use your voice and ask those difficult questions about exactly kind of getting full-time employment um in, in that kind of sector um you know i think you just got to kind of it's it's, re it's such a difficult one because there are so, so many great volunteer opportunities and turning them into something tangible at times can be difficult but look at the volunteer opportunities that you're doing i'd say you know um some volunteer opportunities uh, can seem really good on the outside they can kind of promise the world but you have to pay a lot to do them and um, i'd always argue that those ones wouldn't necessarily be very good um you know if you're kind of if, if you're having to pay for your accommodation your food your expenses and everything and um, then it can become kind of a, di a difficult thing to kind of get out of so you want to kind of really look at where you're spending your time and what, what you're doing and looking forward into the future exactly how you can progress but have those difficult conversations and talk about them and, and don't be afraid to ask um because you never once you ask you never know yeah, that's the only way you're going to get a yes so keep asking keep pushing and then in your in your free time hopefully you know you'll be able to do the other volunteer work that you love but yeah it's it that i know that is a troublesome thing but 
a lot of young people struggle with it's certainly something that I really struggled with it's turning it into something tangible and I wish I had a a better answer for you but I think ultimately the industry itself needs to change in that sense but it is an industry of course it doesn't have all that much money um so yeah it's a, it's a difficult one but if you ask the right questions and ask the right people then you kind of hopefully will get onto a position which can progress further I'm sorry, I don't have more of a concrete answer for you. I wish I did. No, it's fine. Just by saying talking to people is so helpful and actually asking the question because you don't. It can be intimidating. Like talking about money can be really intimidating, but we've all, you know, got to live. But just, you know, ask about those opportunities and, and, and be honest and be candid about it. And, you know, hopefully, you know, if it's not now, it'll be tomorrow, it'll be sometime soon. Um. But yeah, and also kind of look for various different opportunities, keep all doors open, keep all ears open, which I'm sure you are anyway. Um, Thank you. It does come, it does come. (laughs) Thank you, Megan. Uh, Our next question is, what is your favourite wildlife spectacle that you've witnessed in the UK from Finlay? That's a difficult one. That's a really difficult one because there's so many. Um, You know, I'm going to have to go back to sharks again. So I'm going to have to do it because I really do love sharks. Um, And a lot of people don't really see UK waters as being something that's really biodiverse. But actually, it's a little bit cold. If you get a wetsuit on, pop a wetsuit on, pop your little boots on, get your hood on. Hoods are great. Um, But get in the water because, honestly, there is some amazing wildlife to be seen in UK waves, under the UK waves. Um, So we actually have over 40 different shark species that visit our shores throughout the course of the year some are here all year round some come and go depending on the season um and I hadn't actually ever swum with sharks in the UK until last year um when I was doing a planet defenders episode and mine was all about sharks and their plight in the UK and how they're being treated and I got the opportunity to go and swim with blue sharks off the coast of Cornwall and blue sharks are the most amazing things on the planet. They are these kind of medium sized sharks and they're quite streamlined, quite thin. But the moment you are kind of under the water with them, they just sparkle this purple and this blue and this indigo. Um, And they're incredibly kind of inquisitive and gentle animals and they're pelagic species, which mean they live in the open water. So they move around all the time and they're one of the most common species around the world in 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 the open water environments but my goodness they are so so beautiful um and it was it was a tough day actually because in order to get sharks in sometimes you use something called chum and chum is a mixture of fish guts fish scales and it, it it smells as bad as it sounds it really is quite bad and we went out right at the end of the season when we had to use the old chum so it was chum that smells bad but old and therefore extra gross Um, and it was I think everyone on the boat felt very very unwell and it was quite a rocky day but the moment we went under the water and surrounded by about six or seven blue sharks it just all went away because they're just absolutely magical and I think seeing sharks is something that everybody should experience because they're often demonized and they don't have this best the best reputation but actually they are far from what the media portrays them to be because they are incredibly gentle incredibly curious of course like with any other wild animal you do need to be cautious but um that's that's a pretty special one I do tend to love the marine environment but yeah it's a difficult one because there's so many spectacles especially around this time of year with the starling murmurations going on and I love a bar now all of this I get all excited there's so many it's hard to choose from it's always hard to pick a favorite No, I think you picked a great one there, Megan. Thank you. Um, So another question from Louise is, obviously you spent some time on the Isle of Mull during the filming of Autumn Watch. What was your favourite wildlife encounter while over there? Mull looks incredible and is somewhere that she would really love to visit. Oh, I couldn't recommend it enough. Mole is a very special place. I had never been there before, Autumn Watch, so I was really excited that I had the opportunity to go. And when we're filming for the watches, our days are quite full on, so I didn't explore quite as much as I would have, you know, normally would do if I wasn't working. Um, but I had some great encounters with the. There was a hedgehog. It was called Mr. Prickles. I didn't name it. 
I have to say. I didn't call it Mr. I would have called it something like Mike, but they called it Mr. Prickles, which was all right. Um, and he was a, a rescued hedgehog that was quite underweight when he was brought in. And then he was fed up. I think he doubled his, I think he tripled his weight by the time he was released. So he was a very kind of well-to-do hedgehog, very rounded. Um, so that was really nice to meet Mr. Prickles whilst we were filming. And there were lots of great encounters that I know a lot of our, the cameramen had with the um, white tail seagulls interacting with otters and various things. It was very cool. But I because I hadn't been there before after filming, I decided to stay on for a few days um, just to have a look around the island. And I, you know, I really enjoy mammals and um, we saw seven otters in one day, which was pretty spectacular. And there was a, um, a mum and two cubs and they were playing in the water. And that was really beautiful. We just sat on the edge of the road by the water watching these otters play. And that was pretty spectacular. It's a beautiful place and there's so much biodiversity and the eagles come down, particularly when the, the tide is low. So you get these white tailed sea eagles in this particular spot that come down and sit by the water. And um, so you, if you're lucky, you might get white tailed sea eagle at the front with otters behind with goodness knows what happened to be red deer behind that on the other side of the water. I don't know, but it was, um, yeah, very special, very special place. So definitely one to add onto the list of places to explore in the UK. That's for sure. That sounds amazing. I'm very jealous. Um, Rebecca, would you like to ask your question? Um, hello, Megan. Have you ever been to South America for your work? Because I've um, seen some Colombian birds. <laughs> yeah, that's really cool. I've not been to South America very much. I've went to um, Argentina, but I wasn't there for very long because I was on my way down south into Antarctica. And um, so I only was in Argentina for a couple of days and didn't get much of a chance to explore it. But it's always somewhere I've wanted to see. Have you have you been? Have you seen Colombian birds before? Yes, I have. That's and really so cool. My dad. Did you have a favourite species? Um... Just birds. <laughs> you know what, that's a good answer. I like just birds as well, and particularly ones down in Colombia, very colourful. I think that um, conservations and looking after the planet should be um, a school project. I couldn't agree more. I always think that, that people should have at least one day studying outdoors every single week, at least, so people can connect with what's outside their schools and the wildlife and everything. I think that'd be a great idea. You should suggest that to your school, see what they think of it. I will. <laughs> Good, I'm glad to hear it. You have to let me know what happens. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you, Rebecca, for that. Um, Adam, would you like to ask your question? What predatory animals do you still want to work with? Hmm, that's a difficult one. There are so, so many. Hmm, what predatory animal? I'd quite like to do more insects. I haven't done very many insect predatory animals. I really liked praying mantis when I was younger. I had um, a pet praying mantis for a while. I had lots of different things in my bedroom. My bedroom was quite an well I suppose for anybody that wasn't into wildlife walking in was it was quite a surprise because I had lots of different tanks with lots of different things in it um so I really liked a praying mantis one and I, I remember one time apparently well I don't remember I was told that my parents came into my room and I was watching it intently eat a cricket because I was that interested in how it predated it that I couldn't take my eyes off this giant female praying mantis eating this well decapitating taking the head off a cricket and eating it first which sounds quite gross but I was just really interested in the process of how it does that so maybe some more insects would be quite cool maybe some more insects thank you <laughs> thank you Rebecca would you like to ask your question um Hi, Megan. Um, did you do any school projects about nature at school? Hi, Rebecca. Nice to see you. Um, goodness, you're testing my memory. It's been a long time since I've been at school. Um, but yes, I think I did. I did lots, as many as I possibly could. Um, I remember doing presentations on my photography um, for my year when, when we had to do kind of those English presentations and we were learning exactly how to set them up I think I did mine all about penguins um I also tried to get as many kind of different animals into school as I possibly could which I'm not sure you'd be able to do these days and um, I remember one time I I had a 
there was a, a bar now called Marmite who lived at the Hawk Conservancy. And Marmite was a beautiful, beautiful owl. And he was trained to fly around um, and do demonstrations. And he was bred in captivity and couldn't be released back to the wild. Um, anyway, for, for whatever reason, we had him living in our downstairs bathroom for um, a week or so, because I think my stepdad, Chris, was doing talks and was taking Marmite around to do the talks with them. And this was back in the late 1990s. So a long old time ago where you wouldn't do this. I wouldn't have a bar now living in my bathroom anymore. Now, not just because now I know about the mess, but because of the ethics behind it. But um, I remember taking Marmite. So I was only about four or five years old at the time. And I just learned to fly birds and I learned to fly Marmite. And um, Marmite decided in front of the school assembly to fly up to the top of the roof, the chapel, which was where the assemblies were held and stay there for five hours. So I did. I always try to take wildlife in, even though sometimes they'd misbehave. Um, So I would take in kind of my mantis. I think I took in my cockroaches at one point and my teacher wasn't very pleased, but I thought it was a great idea. Um, and yeah, so I would talk about wildlife, talk about environmentalism as much as possible. I wish at school, though, there were more opportunities to like start your own nature clubs or start your own kind of school bird watching group or things like that, because I would have been really into that. But there wasn't so much there when I was at school. But it's something that I hope all of you are into and doing or starting in some way, shape or form. If I could do it again, that's definitely what I'd do. OK, thank you, Megan. Thanks, Rebecca. Nice to see you. OK, um, Jenny, would you like to ask your question? I'm afraid we'll have to make this the last one. Uh, so I was like, wondering, how do you find the experiences and stuff that can like, help like, start career in conservation, like ecology and stuff? Yeah, I mean, there's a lot of resources online is to have a good look. I mean, have a look at the big NGOs. The BTO is obviously a great example for that um, and seeing what opportunities are there. Um, You can look at all the different kind of grassroots charities as well. It's just the case of doing a little bit of research, really, to figure out what's there and get talking. If you go on, you know, if you've got social media, um, go on to that and you'll find there's lots of kind of local conservation community groups which can be really good I really like community conservation because I find that it includes everyone everybody gets involved from an area and whether it's kind of turning your street green and sharing plants or putting in hedgehog highways or turning an old disused football field into a wildflower meadow or something there always tends to be something going on in the community with like-minded people so do a bit of research on social media, look a little bit online um, and you'll be amazed at what you'll find that's out there that's local to you to get involved in. And it's just a case of sending an email, connecting with people. Um, but I'd also suggest, you know, there's there's so many young people. Look at all of you here tonight. I mean, there's so many of you and it's fantastic to see you all. And you've all got such a keen passion for nature, such a keen passion for wildlife. It's really great to see but it all means that you're like-minded and you can support one another. So, you know, get supporting one another, connect over social media, you know, talk to one another if you can. Um, you know, depending on how old you are with your parents' permission or your parents' login details or whatever. Um, but, you know, it's a really important community to have each other. It's really good to have wherever you are in the UK um, or even, you know, abroad. It's really good to kind of build up that network and then you can kind of create opportunities within your own groups as well and make things happen for yourself, which is another really exciting thing. Thanks. No worries. Okay, yeah, I think that might be all we've got time for this evening, I'm afraid, guys. So I just want to say thank you so much for sending in some amazing questions. I'm really sorry we didn't have time to answer all of them, but I hope that you really enjoyed your evening. And um, you can see we've just had a slide pop up on the screen. So if you wanted to follow Megan, she's on Twitter and Instagram. So can find out a bit more about what she's up to and um i believe uh alice winter watch is starting very very soon is that next week yeah isn't that the 18th megan i think so you can see see yeah. more of megan on your screens then yeah we're on for two weeks starting on the 18th through tuesday to friday and i can tell you i've i leave tomorrow for northern ireland which is where i'm going to be based uh, for this series i can tell you i can't give you too much why obviously but i can say there's some really exciting stories i'm going to be getting wet in a river this weekend which is going to be part of a story on eels coming up lots of barn owls which are my favorite and lots of really cool stuff there's some really good conservation stories so hope you tune in and hope you enjoy it 
Lovely, thank you. And if you wanted to carry on um, following the, some of our schemes for the BTO, uh, Birding 101 is carrying on on the 18th of January. We'll be doing Bird ID by Sound. And the next Nature Natters is on the 26th of January, and that will be the amazing Chris Howard from Silverback uh, Films. And that's due to be a great uh, episode. And then very um, briefly, our binocular uh, donation scheme. If any of you feel like you would like some binoculars or scopes, or you belong to a group that could really do um, with some donated, then of course, just apply to our equipment donation scheme. Thank you so much for coming guys. Thank you everyone. Yeah, thank you guys. <laughs>